it's a really good solid performance from Hornby and this is a great upgrade to a stalwart of the range. Hi there everyone, it's great to see you. Welcome back to the channel and I uh, hope I find you well. We're up here in the loft on Weir Yard. I'm Jennifer Kirk welcoming you here and today we're going to be taking a look at a locomotive that, well a version of it has been in the Hornby range and before that the Airfix range since the 1970s. It's a real venerable old girl but it's one that a lot of people clamoured for quite a long time to see it upgraded and Hornby did deliver this and you've probably guessed by now that we're talking about the 51XX Prairie Tank. Now with the big rush of all of those big name releases that we've had throughout this year it's really easy to forget that this all new tooled Prairie Tank came out a little while back and it's still out there in the shops in a variety of different liveries and running numbers but with all the attention being on things like the W1 it's easy to forget about some of those great models that came out not that long ago. Well Hornby have very kindly sent on over an example of the 51XX Large Prairie and I'm really grateful for them for being able to now have a good close look at this model and see whether the all new tooled version lives up to the expectations and those happy memories of summers past. This video comes in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. And we do have a link in the description box down below that takes you to Tramfabrique, their UK and European stockists. Support for this video also comes from PD Models, makers of an amazing range of 3D printed model kits and buildings, and also a whole host of detailing accessories that allow you to turn your own scratch builds into something really special. Find them today at the link in the description box below. But I'm really excited to take a good close look at this large prairie from Hornby. So without further ado, let's see if it's got what it takes. The 51XX Large Prairie is a locomotive whose heritage and model form goes way, way back, actually to the 1970s and the very first shake-up of the British railway model industry. Hornby 00 had uh, gone bankrupt and some of those models had found their way into other ranges, but by and large they remained very niche. And it was uh, Airfix that came into the market with uh, model railway locomotives and rolling stock that really took detail to a new level. And the 51XX was one of those models uh, that came with that 1970s push for extra detail and realism. It's remained a stalwart in the Hornby range where it ended up, but now it had got somewhat long in the tooth so it was well overdue a retool and that is just what Hornby have done with this bringing to the market the locomotive tooled up to a modern super detailed standard and I'm very grateful to Hornby for sending over one of these to enable this review. Now it comes in the standard Hornby packaging and one thing that I really do like about these is on the back they give some great details about the, the class themselves and this is something that I know that we get like leaflets with some other manufacturers locomotives that uh, if you have a read through do give this detail but I quite like it on the slip case it gives a purpose for the slip case and then we also get the uh, works drawings from Hornby and you can see here that these were drawn in 2018. Now these uh, owe their heritage going right back to 1903 when a lot of standardisation took place with the Great Western Railway. Uh, the class themselves were built in a number of iterations over quite a number of years and uh, a number of them actually didn't appear until 
uh, nationalisation. So whilst they owe their heritage and their design to the Great Western Railway, they were only ever a British Rail locomotive. The box themselves, I really do like this. It gives you a great look at what the locomotive is going to look like with a picture of the model rather than trying to peer through all of this plastic packaging. So I quite like that and we get the top down view as well. So I'm just going to get rid of this and uh, get the rest of the locomotive out. Gone are the days of uh, polystyrene, which is no bad thing. Polystyrene not really being a great material. Inside we've got some information about uh, the decoder that's in this and actually I should have shown you the end of the box there. So we've got R3725X and this is the late BR Class 51XX Large Prairie. Uh, resplendent here is number 4160. It comes, as you can see here, ready DCC fitted. So anytime you see an X on the end of the catalogue number, it's basically the same locomotive as the regular version. It just comes factory fitted with a standard Hornby 8-pin decoder. Now we've also got some paperwork here which very very usefully just gives you an idea of what you need to do in terms of some of the extra detail and what is interesting is that these do seem to be set up for DCC sound and I'm going to actually I will take a look inside because I will do a DCC fitting guide even though this does come DCC fitted and the uh, decoder that we do recommend if you get the DCC ready version and want to add DCC to that is the Trainomatic 8 pin decoder and we do have a link in the description box down below that takes you to the UK and European stockists. We also get some information on where the extra detail goes, so things like the uh, drain cocks, uh, the front coupling, we've also got a vacuum pipe, but you can either have one or the other, it's not a both thing, uh, simply because the coupling will get in the way of the vacuum pipe. Also some detail on maintenance and possibly more importantly how to get inside the body. That's always useful as a guide. So we've got two screws uh, at the side next to uh, the front centre wheels that looks like. And then we've also got another two screws. I think one is to remove the bogey to give access to the other but we will investigate that later on in the review. We also get information on where to put the brake rodding. This doesn't come factory fitted uh, and it's something that actually once I've been inside the locomotive and then put it back together, I'm going to have a look at how easy it is to fit that brake rodding. The decoder itself, um, standard Hornby 8-pin decoder and it comes with a booklet which does actually give quite a wealth of information with things like CV settings but I have already test run this locomotive and what I can say is that out of the box you really shouldn't uh, feel the need to have to tweak any of those CVs it's all set up to run really quite nicely out of the box and really you only need to investigate those if there's something very specific that you're looking to achieve so we've got the detailing pack there and uh, we will take a look at that in a moment and the locomotive itself is in the pretty standard clamshell packaging First impressions of the locomotive are really good. It's got a reasonable weight to it. Um, I've had a look online and I'm seeing weights of around 360 or so grams quoted, which does seem to be pretty reasonable. But weight isn't everything and we will test this on the track over some quite challenging um, track work, including point work but also I think more importantly uneven track so it's that change of gradient that can quite often be a problem where effectively you get a locomotive that ends up beached between the front and rear pony trucks so it'll be interesting to see how this performs. In terms of the actual body itself I can see that it's uh, straight and true there's no gaps on the uh, running board there I'm just going to get my steel ruler and uh, I'm going to just take a quick look there and I can see that everything is straight and true. Uh, that does look pretty good. Um, there's no weird gaps opening up. 
One thing I have noticed is that these rear steps, there is quite a bit of flex on there. I'm not going to push them to the limit. I don't want to break them. Uh, not to say that they would be prone to breaking, but they are molded as part of the overall body. Uh, we've got some detail of, I think that that's probably the injector that's just behind there. And it comes in a coloured plastic, which actually does look pretty good, almost like copper piping. The wheel profiles do look good as well. This is an area that I always do look very closely at, and certainly the older model was uh, really lacking in the wheel area. They, they look chunky with steamroller tyres on them. And these, there's no such problem. These have the same sort of finesse that we saw from the 42XX, 52XX and 72XX models. And we've got the um, those single spokes really quite crisp and clean in there. And we can see air all the way through. And that really does look quite nice. That rear bogey has um, a little bit of a, an unconventional pivot. You can see there it moves side to side, but um, the pivot itself appears to be right up here. And there's uh, like a, a long plastic bar that goes in, but there's a great deal of movement in these. Uh, certainly a lot of flex for getting round corners. And we've also got a great deal of vertical flex, which is important to stop the locomotive from getting beached on those changes of gradient. The rear coupling comes ready fitted. It's in a NEM pocket uh, with a triangular tail in there. So you can pop that out if uh, you don't need this type of coupling, say if you're gonna go down the three link route, but it does come factory fitted for your convenience. On the front of the locomotive, all we've got is uh, that pocket just in there and that's where the coupling from the detailing pack will go if you want to fit it. Um, it's entirely up to you but it is something that uh, it does look like it will foul this vacuum pipe and that will need to either be trimmed. I would actually suggest that if you very neatly clip that off that's probably a better way to go because that will look a bit strange uh, in my, my view if you remove that completely. The buffers are fully sprung, turned metal heads and um, it's a pretty decent amount of spring, not too hard, not too soft and they do spring back out of the shanks very very readily and um, there's no problems with them getting stuck inside there. The buffers as well uh, do seem to be nice and robust, there is a little bit of flex on them um, but they are properly stuck in there. The front face of the locomotive is captured really quite well. We've got that very characteristic Great Western look with these uh, stay bars either side. Uh, an awful lot of locomotives had those just for uh, stopping any flex in the buffer beam. Um, and it's something that is very, very characteristic of these uh, Great Western locomotives. In terms of the cylinders, we've got these really quite chunky cylinders. It's something that the Great Western Railway was blessed with a very generous loading gauge because of its broad gauge heritage. And that meant that uh, you could have some quite big cylinders, which in turn meant that these locomotives were restricted with where else they could go on the British rail system because they did have a habit of striking a fouling platform edging coping stones if they went too far off the Great Western system. One of the things I've noticed here as well is that the uh, crosshead slice, this is all metal, all uh, fluted rods there, really nicely done, and the, the crosshead slide, that's all metal, pretty rugged. Um, I think the original Airfix one, all of this was plastic and it did have a habit of uh, being prone to distorting over time, but um, it does have a good quality metal feel to it. Well, it is metal. The bracket over the top, I think, is plastic. It's very difficult to tell, but that holds everything nice and secure. And correctly, the ends of these slide bars are not flared in any way. Um, so that is great to see. In terms of uh, the rest of the detailing, we've got some quite prominent riveting detail. I'd um, assert that 
it's probably a little bit more prominent than they would be on the prototype. But it's, again, one of those things that in model form, sometimes you have to do things differently because being entirely prototypical doesn't necessarily look right. A case in point would be Mark I coach roofs. Uh, when the seams were removed from uh, one model that had been on the market for quite some time, even though that was prototypically accurate, uh, they just didn't look right in model form, in my opinion. So in some respects, having the rivets uh, like that so you can see them does add to the model. I don't think these cab doors are poseable. Now they're kind of, uh, both of them are in the half open, half closed position. They don't appear to be poseable, but if we look inside the cab, there's some great back head detail. We've got the gauges in there. We've got that very prominent reversing lever. Again, something that would be very visible from outside the cab, so it's nice to see that it's there and it's visible. On the other side, we've got the handbrake standard. Again, plenty of options for posing a crew in there, but the detail is really good. The glazing is flush both inside and out. There is a slight prismatic effect. Um, if we just hold that there, you can see that um, it's just got a slight curved edge to it. Not too noticeable, but it is there. And I got into trouble on another review for not uh, pulling hard enough on a cab roof um, to find that it would actually come off. So I am giving this a good prod. Um, it is a separate piece, but it feels like it is glued in place. So I'm, I don't want to break this, so uh, I'm not going to prod too hard. But if you're very, very careful, it does look like it may be possible to uh, gently free up and take off the cab roof. Um, but natively, I don't think it's something that is advisable. On the cab roof, we've got the... Uh, oh, it is actually slidable. So we can pose this roof hatch either open or closed. Again, this is a feature we see a lot with Hornby models. And surprisingly, it's quite robust. Um, so just... Uh, I always leave them slightly open. It just gets a bit of light inside the cab to see some of that fine detail. Um, and then if we look to the back of the cab, we've got these guard rails over the windows. They, they look a little bit uh, chunkier than I might have liked. Uh, they're not too bad, um, but not quite as fine as some of the other metal handrails that we see on the model. And we've also got this quite complex shape around the rear coal load. And the coal itself is removable. Uh, let me just... You need long nails, which at the moment I don't really have. But there we go. So I'm going to pull that out. And we've got this plastic insert. And underneath we do have a full representation of the inside of that bunker. Um, there's not a huge amount of detail, but it does appear to be faithful to the prototype. Um, There's actually quite a large amount of room down in there. And it's something that I've noticed with these is that the bunker capacity is bigger than you might think because it goes down and under the back of the cab a little bit. That does also mean that should you need a space for something like a stay alive, then that is a prime candidate. Um, and for me, that would be where I would immediately look to add something like the Trainomatic Smart Power Pack, should you need uh, that little bit of something extra for getting the running nice and smooth. Although, out of the box, I haven't had any trouble so far with this locomotive with its standard Hornby DCC setup. Safety valve bonnet is quite nicely done. It's something that uh, Hornby are getting very, very good at, is representing these sort of bare polished metals, things like brass, copper, that kind of thing. And they do really look the part. The whistles, they feel like they're plastic, but it is quite a robust plastic. And it's got a bit of a spring to it, so they don't feel like they're at risk of getting broken. 
We don't seem to have a huge amount of detail on the top of the uh, tanks, but there is some detail there, the access hatch. The lifting eyes are part of the moulding, flat on the tank tops, but these water filler caps do look really quite nice. Um, almost good enough to open. Um, they don't, but they look fine enough that you could believe that they would operate um, as you would expect, as the real locomotive would. We've got a small amount of daylight visible just there between the frames underneath the boiler. There's no representation of motion, no um, colour in there of, of the red of the motion. But to be honest, it's not really a big issue. The printing on the model as well is straight and true. Uh, you can see there we've got the uh, kind of ready orange uh, and that is separated from the black there is actually a very tiny amount of green and then we've got the black a little bit of green and then that orange again and that British Railways crest again so so sharp really is nice looking to the back of the bunker we have the running number 4160 on this example it's printed on there and again really nicely done yeah, it is just printed. It's not an etched plate, but certainly that is fine enough to be absolutely OK in my book. To just leave that be. Um, I wouldn't personally see any need to add uh, etched number plates on there, but you can if you really want. There are aftermarket suppliers of such things. And then we've got the, um, the blue circle with the black D in as well, which is about the route availability, I think, um, on the western region. The coupling rods, uh, they have quite a complex shape. You can see they sort of fatten out in the middle before thinning down again. They're not fluted, but certainly they capture that interesting shape subtly, but really, really well. And the wheels, the driving wheels with those spokes, again, really nicely done. And uh, you can also see some of the spring detail through there. We've also got the brake block hangers there all in situ and you can see the holes which will be where the uh, extra um, brake rigging will go uh, when we fit that. The front pony truck is pivoted from back here and that is actually again prototypically correct uh, in terms of its construction and I do like that. It's something gone are the days of just having a metal kind of flange with a lump that has the wheel in. It's so much nicer. Certainly when you see these on the track, they do look absolutely great going through point work because if they're made scale, then they, they conceivably, they of course act uh, like a scale locomotive when they go through the track work. And that is something that the eye always picks up on. The actual pickups on this model, uh, I can see them in there. We've got the phosphor bronze tabs on all six of the driving wheels. I'm just looking to see, I can't see if there's any additional pickups from, certainly not from the front bogey. It's difficult to tell. Um, I don't think there's any extra pickups from the back bogey, but certainly uh, when I had this running, it didn't seem to be uh, unnecessarily uh, affected. One thing I did have to do though, is do check the little pickup tabs by pushing the wheels all the way to one side and then all the way to the other and just make sure that those little tabs are staying in contact with the wheel at both ends of travel and if you need to just very carefully with a pair of tweezers bend them accordingly and mark my words you will have a lot better running if you make sure all six remain in contact with the wheel backs at all times and certainly in most applications you'll then find that things like stay alive aren't usually necessary the rest of the front we've got um, what looks to be a metal smoke box dart and then we've got the smoke box number with the very very tightly printed 4160 really nice crisp clean and overall quite a pleasing model looking down the funnel I'll just have a quick look or chimney chimney funnel 
I use both. I don't care. But there we are. You can see that there's darkness all the way down there. And again, it's something that for me is very important that it looks like it goes down into a smoke box. Because um, in all honesty with you, um, it's what you're going to see a lot of on your locomotive. Now, even though Hornby have very kindly sent over the DCC factory fitted model, I am going to um, take the body off and just show you how you would go about DCC fitting this. And also, I really want to look at that speaker assembly that some of the paperwork did allude to. So we've got the trusty screwdriver set. And as I said at the beginning, if you've got the DCC ready model and you're looking to DCC fit it, then on the channel we do recommend the Trainomatic 8 pin decoder available from uh, Tramfabrik, uh, who are the UK and European stockists. We've got a link in the description box down below. And what we're going to use is the smaller of our Phillips style screwdrivers. And there's two screws, uh, they're actually down by the rear wheel so i'm uh, just going to take one side out and uh, it's going to take out the other one and then there's another screw which is actually hidden just down there it does suggest taking the front bogey off and i'm just going to see it may be that we don't strictly speaking need to um so if you push the bogey all the way to one side let's just see and it's a little bit of a tight fit, but there we go. And yes, the uh, front bogey doesn't actually need to come off. So you can leave that be, just push it to one side and you've got just enough space there to get the screwdriver down the side. And it just, it saves on having bits that could go missing. Inside the locomotive, let's just see what we have got. Now, um, I can see that we've got the space here at the back with the holes cut out so that the sound can escape. So what this tells me is that hopefully we're going to get a TTS sound decoder suitable for these large prairies. Now, I'm a huge, huge fan of the Hornby TTS sound chips. Yes, I know that they are much more limited on features but when you're paying a third of the price for a sound setup then for pretty much 95 percent of people that's going to be more than enough and i think that they offer some amazing value for money so i'm really looking forward to see uh, what comes out suitable for this model and if we actually look here um, there is actually a surprising amount of space underneath that coal insert. Now I did show you that there's a lot of space in there if you want to put say a smart power pack. All you'd need to do is actually drill a small hole for the wires to go through and there's loads of room in there. You could do that even with a sound installation and still have plenty of space left over. The body itself feels like that's entirely plastic. All of the weight in this model is in the chassis and you can see there we've got the motor which, um, let's just take a look, uh, that looks to be a five pole skew wound motor. We've also got this um, brass flywheel which does actually help with keeping the momentum up. The eight pin socket is up there on the top and uh, the factory fitted install is actually really nice and neat. There's a, a convenient little channel inside this front like metal block. Uh, which keeps the decoder really nice and snug and safe. And other brands of decoders as well will fit into that space quite well. It is a generous amount of space, but that gives us a really nice, neat install. So really quite impressed with the space that's inside this model. Putting it back together, really, really easy. Once you've put your decoder in, and um, I will just point out, if we look on the board there, We've got uh, pin one is front left. So just make sure that you get all of that lined up. Uh, let's just get the top back on. And it was a little bit of a tight fit uh, getting it off, but um, actually it's not too bad. Certainly with some of these locomotives in the past, I found that uh, 
when you've actually done a DCC fit, you're so tight on the space that actually um, you end up, let me just see then, you actually end up that it's really, really difficult to get the body back on. Now, something does feel like it's just catching a little bit there. And uh, just need to be a little bit careful. But uh, I can feel it's just sliding in. Don't force anything. And that does look like we are now all the way in. So let's get the screws back out. And they do all three look to be identical. So magnetic screwdriver is really useful for this just to stop the screw from disappearing, falling off. And it's very much like having an extra helping hand. Don't over tighten these screws really it's the same with all locomotives. You've just got to be a little bit gentle. If it's not going in, there will be a reason for that. And there we are. And it's all back together. It is actually quite easy, uh, even though you do have to take the body off. And I am quite impressed with the amount of space in there. When it comes to the extra detailing parts, something somebody said on one of my other videos that they found it really, really helpful to see how the brake rigging went in. So I'm going to just fit that now and uh, you can, uh, we can do this together and then you can see just how it all goes together. So turning the locomotive over, what I can see is quite simple. This way round, so you see the two uh, flappy tails to the rear of the locomotive, there are two holes that they line up with. And then what I suggest is line up one side first. And these just go slide on in. Once you're in on one side, very very carefully with a fingernail don't over force it just gentle gentle and they'll just flick into place really really quite easily the front one's being a little bit more stubborn but if needs be just go and and you just feel it click into place and then the rear of these they just slide push fit down into the holes in the chassis and it's as easy as that and because this is a tank locomotive so it'd be great for shunting i am going to fit the front coupling but uh, i'm not going to fit the rest of the detail um, it's just my personal preference it is going to be a working locomotive so it is something that uh, I find that sometimes they uh, tend to just uh, get hooked up on things. Now, one thing I'm going to have to watch out for is whether or not I need to just trim that. But we'll see once we get it on the track. So we come now to the scores. First up is build quality. And actually this model has really stood up to my rather unsympathetic handling quite well. Nothing has fallen off it. And in particular, one of the areas where I might have been worried, such as the whistles, they really have managed to stay in place and not run the risk of snapping off at all. Other detail on the model has stayed put. Although one of the areas where I did feel that the detail level perhaps could have been a little bit more was on those tank tops. And I did feel that there was a little bit of a smooth plastic feel going on with there, although I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Overall, the build quality really, really good. And I'm going to give this 
and 9.5. When it came to running, out of the box I did find that one of the pickups to the backs of one of the six wheels wasn't quite touching at full extreme. What that actually meant was when it went round certain radius one curves, which I have to point out, it did go round really quite well without any great issue. It did sometimes stutter just a little bit and at super slow speed running, it did sometimes have a tendency to stall. As soon as I adjusted that pickup, all those problems went away. And I suppose it's one of those things that it is good running practice just to make sure that all of your pickups are touching the backs of the wheels before you get going running it on the track. And it does make a big difference. Despite the fact that it's only around 360 grams, the locomotive did perform reasonably well. On a 5% grade around a radius one curve, and it has to be said that that is an extreme challenge for any locomotive, the model did manage a very short train and it puts it on a par, if not slightly better, than a lot of other locomotives in a similar class. On the more level track, it handled a much longer train and I didn't really feel that the locomotive was being overwhelmed by what it was being asked to pull at any point. One of the other areas which I did look out for and was pleasantly surprised is that it coped with undulations, changes of gradient really, really quite well. The pony trucks front and back handled the change of gradient really quite well and never once left the locomotive feeling like it was getting beached. So overall, I'm going to give this a 9.0 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation, you do still have to take the body off this locomotive. It's something that we're seeing coming through from a lot of other manufacturers, much, much easier ways of getting the decoder in and out of locomotives without risking any damage to detailing parts and certainly not needing to take bodies off. With this locomotive, taking the body off though was surprisingly easy and one thing that did really impress me was the amount of space available for a sound fit as well as a stay alive and in fact fitting both of those to this locomotive is by the looks of things something that would be incredibly easy to do and certainly it's something which I am quite tempted to just to see how much electronics I could get away with putting into this locomotive. It has a lot of potential for future improvement in that area and I could well see this being a model that would be an easy upgrade for anybody wanting to add firebox flicker and also working head and tail lamps. Certainly there's a lot of scope to uh, have a few great projects with this locomotive. So it really did pull it back in that area and I'm going to give it an 8.8. .8. On accuracy and quality of finish, overall the locomotive is really good. Those BR crests are absolutely sublime. This is an area that Hornby are doing really, really well with. The lining is crisp and sharp and the rest of the actual finish on it is really, really good. One area which for me just felt somehow just a little bit flat is the detail on top of those tanks. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it did feel to be that this was probably the one weak spot of the model. Those lifting eyes are molded on and completely flat to the tank top. And there's something about them that just shows that. There also feels like it could have been a slightly more matte finish. The shine doesn't quite do it for me, but there is still a lot of other details. So overall, I'm going to give this an 8.0 out of 10. On value for money, it really is quite good. When we're seeing locomotives past the two and even 300 pound mark, the price tag on this model is still pretty reasonable. And for that, you do get a lot of model. It's a good solid performer. It's robust enough that even with a little bit of heavy handling, it's going to do just fine. It has a wide availability and I do like the potential for future projects with that extra space inside for doing things like sound fitting, stay alive fitting and plenty of options for adding in extra lighting 
which would be quite an easy fit with the space that is available without having to butcher the locomotive at all. So I'm going to give this a 9.0 out of 10. And that gives us an overall score of a very credible 44.3. I'd like to extend a big, big thank you to Hornby for sending over this model for review, and it gets the thumbs up from me. It's a really good, solid performance from Hornby, and this is a great upgrade to a stalwart of the range. Well, if you really liked today's video, don't forget that we do have a link down below that takes you to where you can find all the models that are still available at the time of filming. Also, please do consider tickling that like button and sharing the video as well. And if you haven't already done so, then do please consider subscribing to the channel to be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. You can also find us over on Patreon and help to support the channel to make the videos that you want to see. I also love hearing from you, so do please leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. If this is a model that you have, I'd love to hear what you think about this model. Do you agree with me? Is this something that you think that I've missed? Do you fundamentally disagree with me? I'd love to hear from you all, and I do read each and every one of your comments. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Coat, saying you take great care of yourself. Stay safe now. Happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. Today's video also comes with the support of PD Models, makers of a whole range of 3D printed kits and accessory detailing that brings something special to your model layout. Available in a number of different scales and gauges, this range is sure to have something for you, so check them out at the affiliate link down below to see what they have got today to make your model layout something special. PD models are also well known for their museum quality models that can be made bespoke to order. So do contact them if you have some specific requirements and see if they can do something special for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, OORail.co.uk, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grantline Products, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYM Arish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Graham Foster, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 class, Ian Coulson, and Alan Dickerson. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.